divide this one up into three pieces today. Some of you were not with us following Baylor. So if you have any questions about that game, we'll start there. And then we will talk SMU tomorrow. And then we will talk UCA on Sunday. So does anyone have any questions for coach related to the Baylor game? Let's start there. Yeah, I, I got one. Okay, far away. Sorry. Coach, after the game, uh, during the press conference, I noticed that Destiny Slocum just come right back out on the floor and just was shooting free throws. And I got to watch, you know, free throws and working on the driving layup. Uh, what is the testament of a team, you know, having that leadership coming into this season that, you know, they're already, you know, they're trying to relish the win, but yet their main focus is on, on the run in the SEC tournament and the NCAA tournament run? Well, I think it shows that we've successfully navigated away from goals uh, and have become truly standards driven, you know, in that, yeah, we won the game, but man, I missed two layups I normally make and I miss free throws that I normally make. And that could come, that could have been the difference if these other things hadn't worked out. Uh, she wasn't the only one. There, there were other kids that were coming in and came over here to the BPC. I saw the lights pop on and Amber's down there and Chelsea's down there and Michaela's down there. So, you know, I, I think it is a great piece of evidence that that stuff's starting to work. Because, um, again, in the past, we would lose a close game and kids were more concerned about, you know, where the pregame meal was uh, there or hot still or, or whatever. So it, it's changed. The standard has been changed. The celebration was great. We're still on it. They've got exactly one hour and 28 minutes to continue to enjoy that. And then we're going to start getting ready for SMU. But I, I think to answer your question, Porter, it, it shows that we've successfully navigated away from goals into standards, and, and we can always find ways to improve uh, even in a, a win like that. Anyone else have anything Baylor-related before we get started on SMU? All right, Coach, you want to go ahead and give a little opening statement about SMU? Yeah. Uh, you know, we put this game together to take Taylor Thomas back home. Uh, even though we play games in Texas and the SEC, I just think it's something we try to do for as many players as we possibly can. It doesn't always work out, but fortunately, Travis Mays and I are friends, and he understood the value in the game. And even during the COVID, when a lot of people were dumping games, I really got a lot of uh, respect and, and thank, appreciation to Travis for keeping this game. Um, it would be a really good test for us uh, to, to enter – uh, some uncharted territory of how do we handle a big game next game? We haven't had that. Uh, how do you handle that? Do you, do you move on and do you, can you learn from a, a win? And then we're trying some unique things too, to, to be as COVID sensitive as possible. We are going to travel the day of the game. Uh, so we will not leave until the middle of the day tomorrow. It'll not be our traditional, you know, get up from the hotel and go do a shoot around and get used to the rims and, uh, some of those things, and we're taking a skeleton crew uh, on the plane just to make sure that we're uh, giving ourselves to mitigate as many chances as we can to not have to cancel games. So there's there's a lot of new firsts for us in this. Um, and, you know, knowing what I know about our, our, our leadership in the locker room, I, I think we'll be okay, uh, but it's going to be fun to see a new challenge. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, uh, you, you kind of hit on uh, a direction I was headed, and, and I'll ask a question this way. Yep. Was there anything that you you changed or learned from your trip uh, at Thanksgiving that you're going to do differently now? Yeah, um, we're going we're gonna to consistently move seats on the bus and the plane, and it's not get that, you know, that, tw that, that magical number of 15 minutes together. The plane's big enough that we should be okay. The bus creates some problems. Um, not getting bags off at the same time, not walking in the hotel, not get on the elevator with each other. All that stuff adds up. And, you know, I, the reason I'm so um, attentive to that, somebody brought it up the other day, said, yeah, you do all that stuff. And then I see you run out there and hug one of your kids after the game. I said, well, that's why I do all that stuff. That's why we do care about who carries the bags in together. And I take in, I ride in a car with Mario. I mean, that's my penalty. I have to ride with Mario. I can't even get on the bus. Um, so we do all those things so that when, it, damn it, when I want to hug a kid, I'm going to go hug her because we have a big celebration because the other times of the day, we are apart. So we learned a lot 
and um, it was, you know, it, it's carried value, and I think it's going to continue to carry value. We're still learning, uh, but this, uh, it, it's, it's part of the necessity uh, for us to make sure our kids are, A, staying safe and still being able to compete because they want to do both. They don't want an either or. They want to be able to play, but they still want to stay safe. So it's, we have to worry about that so they don't have to. Tara, go ahead. Yeah, what can you tell us about this SMU team and some of the challenges that they present? They've got size, which is always the bells and whistles in our head. Size, size, size. It doesn't matter that you, you played against it before. It, they're all different. They've got size. And, you know, I'm always leery whenever we play a, an Arkansas. They got Reagan Bradley, who's from Arkansas, who played at Little Rock Christian. Um, and it, it's just one of the and, – and they've got a style of play that could, could give us some fits. They, they play high-low. They throw it inside. Uh, they try to guard the perimeter, uh, take away three. So um, there are a lot of concerns. Um, and you, when you couple those with everything else we just talked about, they magnify. But they've certainly got players that are, were recruited by SEC schools um, that choose SMU because of their location and their academics and where Travis is going with the program. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it is a, a good, another good piece challenge for us in, in this schedule. But they played last night. You know, they played Oklahoma State on the road. So I know they're traveling back. Um, and, uh, you know, I know they'll uh, they'll have a plan. I know Travis well enough. He was he was y'all remember him played for Texas men's basketball team back in the Southwest Conference days, and used to have some have some great games against the Razorbacks. So uh, anytime I see his name attached to a team, I I, I know we're gonna get we're gonna get a a team that's well prepared. Stephen, go ahead. Hey, Coach, um, as far as your style of play offensively, when you're in transition, I noticed that um, you like to force the pace and get up shots quickly. Uh, as a message to your players, uh, what's considered a good shot uh, in your playbook? One they've made multiple times in practice. It's that simple. We, I, I want them to have made it 10 times in practice before they try it in a game. So it's funny, you'll see them, you'll, they'll kind of count, like I'll use Alexis Tolfrey last year as an example. You know, she'd pull up from about 30 feet in practice. And finally she says, coach, that's the 10th time I've made it. I've done it now in practice. I'm going to pull one tomorrow night. And sure enough, she did. So uh, that's kind of our goal, that. And then, then you have to relate it to the time in the score, you know, base it on the time in the score. Like I'll use another, Marquisha Davis the other night after two tremendously huge stops and baskets for us in that third quarter got loose and was wide open at the top of the key for a three and she fired it. She's made it, but not 10 times in practice yet. So that was maybe one that we would have said, Hey, I'd like to have back, but that's a simple, it's a simple rule. Have I made this shot uh, when the lights are on in practice before I try it in the game? Um, and then, then have a little bit of understanding of time and score, which it, it usually takes more than five or six games, but this group's learned it pretty fast. Porter, go ahead. I would to touch on, you were talking about that high-low game, and one of the few things that Baylor did have success with the other night was, you know, dumping it down low. So, you know, what can you, you know, tweak and change to help that penetrate in the middle of the court and then dump it down low? We'll be able to pressure the ball a little bit more against them than you could Baylor. The, the problem with coming out and putting too much pressure on Alyssa Smith is she'd rip it and go by you. Um, you know, SMU is going to be more apt to shoot it in the high-low, so we'll be able to close out a little bit closer and put a little bit more pressure there, which gives our little our smaller matchups a chance to establish better position. Uh, and we won't be giving up quite as much height and quite as much strength as we were. Um, but our guards can do a better job of, you know, you know, kind of kind of showing and going, a little, little game of cat and mouse down there. And and I think the other night we got a chance to work on about three or four different ways that we double the post. So keeping them off balance is the key. Just not letting them settle in. Um, giving them a different look every time, you know, we're, we're kind of a scheme defense. Todd really does a good job of breaking down what other teams are trying to do. And then we scheme against it. So, um, I, I think, um, I think there's, there's room for growth still, but I think we made a lot of improvement on that. And in the film work that we saw from where our mistakes were made against Baylor, uh, will carry over down there, but a little more pressure on the ball, 
and a little bit more, uh, a better job by our guards kind of, you know, keeping them off balance. Tyler, go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned trying to schedule this game for Taylor. Um, have you, did you talk to her at any point after it was scheduled or this week? Just what is her excitement level like? It's good. She was our guest on our luncheon yesterday. A lot of people ask her about it. You know, I didn't tell her about it until we got the contract signed and back. And when I did, I broke it to her in the training room. She was ex extremely excited and immediately started uh, cashing in favors from all of her teammates to get extra uh, complimentary tickets because they're only letting family in. So she went to work. She's been working on that most of the year. Uh, and then when the COVID hit, this game was initially scheduled in those first two weeks. This was going to be our home op – their opening. We were going to play it on that Tuesday – uh, that you can start the season. So it went away for a while. Uh, and, and thankfully, Travis was able to find a date for us to move it. Uh, so I got a chance to, to surprise her again the second time and say, hey, this is still on. So she's really excited. Her family's excited. She's got high school teammates in the area that are, are really excited for her to be there. And uh, again, a chance to play literally in your hometown and not just in and around. Uh, she's very excited. And very thankful. You know, if you've been around Taylor enough, she's she's quiet at times, but she really opened up yesterday on that lunch and talking about how thankful she was that, uh, you know, her teammates would help her out and the coaches would think about stuff like that. So that makes you feel good when you when you get that response from a player. Brett, do you have anything? Yeah, I do. First, it's good to see Stephen Howard on here. He and I worked several games at SMU, including hanging out with a former president courtside a few times there. But uh, uh, Mike, you mentioned that, that SMU game. Is that common now? Do you do, do get to go through the mechanics of scheduling and then have to go back and beg a school to stay committed to it before a contract? Is, is that part of the process? Uh, we didn't have to beg him. It was a one phone call. And he said, yeah, let's let's find a way. I know it's important to you. So, but yeah, it was this year. It's, I mean, it's just all COVID related. Uh, but yeah, you've seen across the country, there's, there's opponents who, you know, have, maybe manipulated the system a little bit and, and found ways to improve their schedule because of the pandemic. But Travis wasn't, he, he wanted the game. He knew it was valuable and it was an easy one with him, but we, have, we haven't faced that, but I, I have colleagues who have been facing it some, but we haven't had to go through that. Everybody's been very from ORU Monroe. And of course the in-state schools have been great to work with. So uh, it's kept coach Schaefer very busy. His phone, every time his phone rings, we kind of hold our breath because He's the one that gets the call about COVID testing and scheduling. So we, we don't much like it when his phone's ringing in the middle of practice. Randy, do you have anything? Mike, talk about your rotation. Are you starting to feel comfortable with your rotation? Very much so. Those eight have been so good in their roles. Um, Jalen is really accepted, you know, coming in that first sub, all she does, she knows when there's a dead ball after the six minute mark, just to stand up and go in. She doesn't always know for who, but she knows she's going. And a lot of it depends on the pace, of the game and foul trouble, but she can go for four positions. She can go in for, for Mac, for Slocum, for Chelsea or for Amber. Uh, and I think she could probably play for Taylor if we needed her to. So she knows she's going, she's really accepted that. You know, not seeing her name said in the starting lineups. But other than that, her role has not changed. Just when she goes in to do it, she's been great. Marquisha Davis's spark off the bench has you, – you could really easily argue we don't win that game without her spark in that third quarter. Um, uh, and she's done it consistently for us. She's made that soft freshman to sophomore jump that you hope kids make. Not all of them do because some kids sit over there during their freshman year and pout, but she did not. She learned. She took advantage of every opportunity in practice and all of our game after the games and every chance that she got and took coaching. And, and now as a result, uh, you know, she's one of my eight starters. And then, of course, Erin Barnum, you know, we, we saw what she could do uh, in the high school and her state tournaments back then. And she's got on campus. She's got adjusted to be a student athlete and taking care of the classroom and her body uh, and recovery and the importance of rest and you know, she's been explosive. So that rotation has been, it's, it, it's set. It's going to be really hard for, you know, we, I, I've got ultimate confidence in those eight and we've got nine, nine, 10, 11, 12, pretty good players, but they've just got to earn their confidence through, through being able to do it. You can't be confident until you do it. And they're going to get some opportunities. That's the one thing about COVID 
in losing some of these games, we didn't get a chance to develop 9, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, but they're going to get that free year back. So they're learning. They're doing it in practice. And if, if you look up and we have McGee, Oberg, or Langerman out there, they're good players too. They, they could be doing it for us. So we are, we are in a great spot. We know we're fortunate. I talked to buddies across the country. You know, here I am worried about having eight starters and finding playing time for 9, 10, and 11, and they just tell me to shut up and move on because they're trying to get five players on the court. So we just take it for what it is, and, and, and hopefully we keep having, you know, what, what my buddy calls, you know, first world problems of having good players. Steven, go ahead. Coach, I wanted to ask you about your uh, team's conditioning, which is exceptional for the pace that you push throughout the game. How how has that changed throughout your your coaching career? And you know, with the advent of load management, do yeah. you and COVID, do you have to uh, measure your practices as far as how much you push them to sustain that type of conditioning? Um, how is how, how have you evolved as a coach? Well, well, you nailed it when you said it, it, it happens in what you do in practice. I, I, I developed as an assistant coach for 14 years, sitting around with my notebook of, you know, how I was going to do things when I got to be a head coach. <laughs> um, whether it was right or wrong at the time, I didn't really know. But I felt like I wanted to be known as somebody who had their players ready to play the games. And I just always in practice felt like there was wasted time. There was, you know, two line layups or this passing drill or this something just to fill a practice schedule because somebody saw it at a clinic. I wanted to be different. And we wanted every drill to be meaningful. Every drill was a passing drill. Every drill was a shooting drill. Every drill was a rebounding drill. And every drill was game like. And when you practice that way, you stay in shape, your game shape. And then you get with you get your strength and conditioning coach on the same page and your in your athletic trainer on the recovery, and you tell them you're going to have extra time with these kids because we're only going to practice for an hour and a half to start the year, and we're going to be down to an hour by the end of the year if everybody does their job. And I think our kids know now that if you will, you're going to stay in shape by practicing hard. You're not going to have to run extra because practice gets you there. I think you see that too in the transformation that a lot of kids have had in their, in their bodies when they come here and, and when they play here. Um, every day is a challenge. You, you have to be in shape to even practice. And if you miss practice, our strength and conditioning coaches make you want to go back to practice. You'd rather be in practice than with them. So it, it's a, it takes everybody. It takes your nutritionist. It takes your strength and conditioning and your athletic trainers all on the same page. Um, but when you do that, then you get them game ready. So when you mentioned the word load management and all these technologies and all these doodads are fun, but I still pick out my best conditioned athlete and look how red her cheeks are. That's all I go by. If, if I know if, if Michaela Daniels is bending over and grabbing her shorts, or Destiny Slocum's cheeks are pink, then everybody's tired. So uh, as much as technology and load management can be measured, um, I still go back to the small tricks of the trade when it comes to that, but I, we will stop practice. We'll stop a drill short. If it has anything, if, if I feel like, or we feel like it's going to cost them minutes in the game, it's not worth it. You need to have them ready at game time. And, and that's been a seven year. We still tweak it with some things, but you, you have to value every single second of the week. Um, then what you get from that, too, I'll take it one step further, is, is now the kids have energy to come back in on their own. Uh, if, if you practice for three and a half hours, then the kids are out of time, and they won't come back in and get the shots up that they need to get up. So there was a lot of unintended consequences or an unintended results, however you want to look at it. But um, as long as they let me have head coach on it, we're going we're gonna to play that way. Would you sound an awful lot like my former coach in Utah, Jerry Sloan, with your – with your well, he, he is somebody that I've tried to emulate in a lot of ways. Uh, he, I think, was way ahead of the game back then uh, when he he would talk about players and, and I, talking to Brendan Sir and some people that worked with him. They said this, that I take that as a huge compliment. Uh, but I, I, I try, I've studied his, some of his things, and uh, he was ahead of the game. That's for sure, Stephen. Porter, go ahead. Porter, you muted. He did it again. 
Damn it, he fell for it again. Forgot to unmute two times in one, a row. Needed one for the other hand. <laughs> it, anyways, you've been blessed having multiple guards that have been able to drive to the basket. And I've noticed the past few games, they just keep getting, you know, quicker and quicker. So how has that really helped you balance your game plan other than relying on the three a lot? Yeah, well, we've, we've given up more three attempts than we've taken through six games, which is really rare for us. But again, we can't, we can't decide how other teams guard us. And, and that's in that make them wrong mentality. So obviously you don't recruit a kid that can't shoot it and drive it a little bit. And then you got to give them the space and opportunity to do it. Um, you know, if, if you don't, if you've got a, a, a kid like Chelsea and, and Slocum and Mac and, and now even Amber, I mean, Amber Ramirez got five half court layups against the best defensive team in the country because you're opening up gaps in space. If, if you've got to give them the opportunity to do that and the freedom and the confidence, you know, you know, people always say we over dribble the ball. Uh, okay. Well, I'll show me, let me, let me show you the end result. Chelsea Dungey's leading the country and made free throws. I think slope. I think uh, Mac is second. I think Aaron Barnum's third or fourth. And if she'd make more free throws, then she'd be up there with slope with uh, Chelsea. But I think we've got one, two, and four in the country in free throw attempts. So those numbers have to be in the line. If the, if the free throws go down, then the threes better go up. But those numbers combined. Um, so recruit them, coach them, and then give them an opportunity to go do it. And, and, and tell them not to worry about what they hear on TV about dribbling the ball too much. Dribble is the hardest thing to guard in the, in the game right now. Passes are – everybody works on shell drill. Move on the pass, move on the pass, get into it. But very few people work on guarding the ball. All right, does anyone else have any questions related to SMU? Okay, we will go ahead and move on to UCA. Coach, you want to talk a little bit about that game? Yeah, you know, we were scheduled to start the in-state uh, tour next year. Uh, we were going to play all four of them uh, once it became open from our – Board of Trustees reached out to everybody and got contracts done with everybody for starting in the 21-22 season. Then when COVID hit, they lost a few games. We lost a few games, got on the phone immediately, and were able to get three of them. We didn't intentionally do them back-to-back-to-back, -to -back -to -back, but it, it kind of feels like a state championship now, uh, considering UAPBs played Arkansas State. Arkansas State couldn't work it out this year. We would have played all four of them. Um, and then uh, when, you know, you know, we got a hold of UCA and we're able to move that game up a year as well. Um, just um, it's a game I'm glad we got started and able to move. Uh, you know, they've challenged themselves. They played Baylor, too. We've got a common opponent in Baylor. Uh, they've gone out and really uh, challenged themselves with a very aggressive non-conference schedule. I haven't watched a lot of film on them yet, so I don't know as much maybe about them as I should because – Again, I'm a little stitious about looking at another opponent before uh, we play the other one. But uh, the game itself came together that way, and we're, we're really glad that we were able to I, – I, it helps us, and I know it helps them in this COVID year to, to play a game that's locally traveled. And um, it, it's good that we're both going to get benefit out of it. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, uh, can, can you just talk about what it means to, to women's basketball in the state to be able to – to, to play all these in-state opponents and, you know, after the history and everything that, that goes back with this. Yeah, there's, I just, I hope it shows there's so many places to stay home. You can stay in state and, and go to a, a wide variety of academic schools, cultural schools, uh, geographic areas, and, and not have to leave our state. And there's so many players, our state is kind of starting to get the recognition it's deserved for a lot longer, probably. You know, I, I think with the, the recent success of players, unfortunately, leaving the area sometimes to go play places, uh, but now coming here, um, and, and I think there's a really good chance you see two McDonald's All-Americans from our state this year for the first time ever, um, and, and things like that. So I think it's good for that reason, that you don't have to go to X school or Y school. There's always Z and, and these all these different options. And what Don's building at UAPB gives oh, just gives a – all these options, uh, geographically, academically, conference-wise, level of play. You know, there's a wide variety of level of play. And I just think it adds to, um, you know, the camaraderie too. You know, our, our, the, it, it gets you closer with these coaches. And other than the night that I play it, we play all these guys. I'll hope they win every game. 
you know, and I think that gets us all pulling for each other until we play. And, you know, I, I guarantee you somebody makes a state championship shirt if, you know, if, if UCA pulls off or they'll, they'll have a shirt printed up that says state champion or UALR or somebody, I know how that works in recruiting. And when it came out, I, I publicly said, and I'll say it again, we're going to lose one of these games at some point in time. And I'm okay with that. You're, you're not just because we're in the biggest conference or we have the, the, the most profile and maybe that's not even true some places, but we're going to lose and that's okay. You know, and we're all going to still end up the, with the recruits we should get if we do our jobs. And, and the better we all are, it just raises the level and the profile of our state. You know, you, you dream of the day when we're all five in the NCAA tournament. You know, you hope that. Um, or multiples. And instead of, oh, they're in and we're out. And I used to read that crap on the message boards when I was at other places about, you know, Coach Foley's, you know, in the NCAA tournament and Arkansas's not. And then UCA goes and then Arkansas – you know, I, I get it's fun on the message board, but in reality, we're all better when we're all good. So now we get a chance to go out there and play the games, and it com completely eliminates all that talk. And um, I think we owe it to our, our high school coaches, our grassroots coaches, and our fans uh, to play the game. And, and I think it's one of the best decisions our board of trustees, led by, you know, Hunter and, and Chancellor Steinmetz, you know, making sure they understand – the importance of it. And then COVID helped, you know, I think that probably helped push it along a little bit faster. And, but I think we're all seeing positive results from it. Brett, go ahead. Long answer. Sorry. Hey Mike, following up on that, you know, in Iowa, I think the four men's teams play a double header and there's two games back to back. Could you ever envision a scenario where four in-state teams, you know, play two games in one location about this time of the year? We kicked that around a little bit. We used to in Oklahoma, too. We had the Bertha Teague Classic in Oklahoma and Oklahoma State and Tulsa and Oral Roberts would get together. That was when I was at Tulsa. Uh, and those were great events. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been talked about maybe every fifth year, you know, like meet one place and then rotate it to our different campuses. I think we all want to see how the, the, the four, four game, the four series goes, but it's certainly something that's talked about. Uh, and even potentially bringing in, you know, outside league opponents if we can't find a way to play each other. But I, I think it's just too good of an opportunity. We will go to all these places too. We're we're already going to Little Rock. We'll go to Jonesboro. Uh, we'll go to Conway eventually, and we'll go to UAPB eventually. So uh, I think it's important for our kids to to go those places uh, over the course of the series and, um, and realize that even though we are a, a small state, there's a lot of really unique places. Uh, geographically that some of our kids haven't ever experienced. So we need to. Randy, go ahead. Mike, I'll kind of dovetail off of that uh, matchup upcoming with Little Rock. Uh, your thoughts on Little Rock beating the other night, they, they defeated Vanderbilt. And then based off of last year's matchup with uh, Little Rock, which was at uh, Verizon Arena. Uh, what are you anticipating? I know Central Arkansas is super pumped over uh, the Razorbacks coming back to Little Rock, this time playing at the Jack Stevens Center. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I, I didn't consider it an upset when UALR beat Vanderbilt, to be honest with you. I, you know, Vanderbilt hadn't played a game yet, having played those guys and knowing how Coach Foley does with his team, that, that didn't surprise me. Uh, that was that was predictable uh, from our seat, and that's not a knock against Vanderbilt. That's a compliment to to what he's built there and the tradition they built there. Um, and and playing in Stevens is, believe me, I it wasn't the easiest decision I ever made. Uh, I know how hard of a place that is to come out of there and get a win. That's part of the reason we played Florida Gulf Coast at Florida Gulf Coast too. So it, it wouldn't be our first time. Um, their their respect that he's earned with us and his players. A lot of them know those players. And we played really well last year, Randy. I mean, we played really good. And our kids know that. They know we played really good. So there won't be any looking back and going, ah, we beat these guys, whatever we beat them by last year. It's going to mean something this year. They, they know the difference. Uh, so um, it, it, it speaks to what he has built there and what that university has done for women's basketball and, and made it important. Uh, for for now a number of years. Uh, so being able to play there, I, I felt like – I kind of feel like it's an honor, you know, for us to go in there and, and be – I guess we'll be the first team to play there from Arkansas. 
um, it's, a, it's an honor to do that. Tyler, go ahead. I'm all good, uh, but how about them Greenwood Bulldogs, Coach? Hogs and dogs. Can you see my picture in the background over there? Uh, that's, a, that's the hogs on the front and the dogs on the bottom. I, I've said hogs and dogs since uh, 1977 has been my thing, so really proud of the, uh, the football team and all the sports down there. It's uh, When we fly out, I can still pick Greenwood out. When we're going south, we fly right over Fort Smith, and I can see – it looks like a small college down there. I see my – my house I grew up in, I see if – it's, if it's not cloudy, we're not quite high enough yet. If we're too high above the clouds, obviously can't see it. But, um, but no, really, that's – I think their 10th state championship, you know, which, you know, I think it's been well documented back when I graduated. The only state championship we had was my mind championship that we won in, in 96. So, I mean, 86. So, it's good they finally got some up in football and other sports, but – you know, Coach Young's done a great job filling in for for what, you know, Coach, not filling in, but continuing what Coach Jones started. And I think it's legal for me to talk about football teams. If it was basketball, I think I'd be committing a violation, but uh, come get me. Porter, go ahead. I just want to finish off with the, the recruiting and the fan base, the impact of being able to play all over the state, you know, with, with you trying to grow the fan base. And this yeah. gives recruits more, uh, you know, opportunities to see you and – and the fans in Eastern Central Arkansas. No, you're right. And that was, you know, that's the selfish side of it. The, the business side of it is it does help us. It's got impact to be able to play and take these kids back. You know, when we will be taking Alana back to Jonesboro, we'll be taking, you know, Aaron and we took Kiara back to the Little Rock area and other players, but the future kids to see us, the young, young kids that might be inspired by coming and seeing, you know, Dungy and Slocum and all these kids that are here now and remember that. I know exactly how I felt the first time. I still have Tony Brown's sweatband in my collection and Daryl Walker's headband and a practice jersey from Charles Ballantyne. I've still got those things, you know, and I'm old in a relic. And i got some other cool stuff. But those I, I remember Tony Brown throwing me that sweatband. Every time I see him out on the road, I remind him of it. And he laughs. He said, I can't believe you still have that thing. Uh, but, you know, little things like that, you know, if, if we can just – spark one kid per game per gym then it, it makes it all worth it all right does anyone else have any questions for coach all right that'll wrap up thanks, thanks everybody coach.